Good afternoon and welcome to the February Great Book Series. Uh, this semester we have a lot of exciting presenters and we are starting off with one of the top three. Um, okay, uh, I'm here to introduce Terry Easley Geraldo. Okay, I knew her when she was 12 and she started here 19 <laughs> years ago. Okay, uh, she came straight out of graduate school, took over the debate program, did a wonderful job, and then six years later, uh, moved to a regular full-time position, okay? Um, she teaches public speaking, intercultural communications, interpersonal communication. She's done debate, leadership, and honors forums on political campaigns, which might come in useful in the next coming months, okay? Um, she is heavily involved in many committees. One of the things she forgot to list, but that takes up most of her time, is that she is the current chair of communications, um, and they're a rowdy bunch, okay? Um, she's on a lot of committees, but she is most heavily involved in the honors program, and as the advisor to LUNA, the Latinos United Now and Always Committee. She's a safe zone facilitator and was part of the core team for the Kansas Leadership Center Transformation Grant, okay? Uh, she does virtual exchanges in her classes around the world, uh, Costa Rica, the Netherlands, and Russia, and she's been doing that for 13 of the 19 years that she's been here. She uh, started off doing editorial work in graduate school and has continued as part of the editorial board for the studies on debate and oratory. Uh, she works with Global Ties KC as a guest presenter for various international guests and diplomats. Uh, diplomats, and she's a Daisy Scout leader, which probably takes more energy <laughs> than all of that. Her degrees are in literary studies, which is, I guess, English, right? Yes, we knew we liked her. Um, communications, an MA from Baylor, and her PhD from the University of Kansas with a focus on political communication and leadership. Her current research continues in political communication as she explores uh, campaign strategies, social media, gender, and leadership. Uh, she doesn't list many hobbies, although her two kids keep her pretty busy. And from August until, I guess, February every year, the Chiefs do as well, okay? She chose this book. She first encountered Adam Grant's work uh, during her last sabbatical and found that it was, which was focused on productive disagreements and civil discourse. Um, she thinks his work is important and relevant in our very polarized society where everyone, th I love this line, where everyone thinks they know everything and is afraid to be wrong or change their mind. He stresses the importance of keeping an open mind and argues how to fix mindset, and Terry is gonna tell us all about it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for that very warm welcome. And thank you, Maureen and Michael, for everything you do for Great Book Series. It's a wonderful opportunity to get to hear from our colleagues about various books across campus and all the work that goes into coordinate all of the very different offices and the speakers who might be high maintenance at times and all of that. So they do a wonderful job um, with all of that. So thank you for what you do. So I'm going to start by asking you, how many of you like being wrong? No one. I thought at least one person would raise their hand. Ah, there, Jay, of course. Jay is our one. So maybe by the end of today, you'll realize or you'll be open to the idea that maybe it's okay to be wrong. Maybe it's fun to be wrong. Or maybe we can maybe just open our minds a little bit and move that needle sometimes and realize that we don't know everything, right? Might be hard with this group, but no, I'm, I think we'll be good. So I want to spend a little bit of time on, and this is not working on who Adam Grant is, but the clicker is not working. So eventually, I think Jody is to the rescue, you'll see a picture of him. And um, he is a professor of psychology at Wharton in Pennsylvania. He's been rated the top professor for seven straight years at Wharton. And oh, there we go. And that's all of Wharton. So for seven years, he's been the best professor at Wharton. Um, he's won teaching awards for every single class he's ever taught. Students rave about how amazing he is. Um, he's been recognized as the world's number two most influential uh, thinker on management, and he's been one of Fortune's 40 under 40. Um, he's only a few months younger than me, so he makes me feel like a 
big underachiever. <laughs> just all of this and then the books that he's written in just a moment, but we'll you know, set that aside. His bachelor's degree is from Harvard. He won all the honors at Harvard. He, you can see he, there's a trend here. He got his PhD from the University of Michigan in organizational psychology, and he did it in three years. So those of you who've gotten a PhD, that's time to roll your eyes and go, yeah, you did it in three years, congratulations. Uh, again, an overachiever there. So he's been the number one New York Times bestselling author of six books. Every single book he has written has been a number one bestseller, he sold millions of copies, and it's been translated in 45 different languages. And his expertise is really relatable to all of our lives. It's something that every book of his is very relatable and something you can learn from. So it's not like academic reading that you're like, oh, this is really interesting and really exciting and I don't care, right? So it's very relatable. Um, his expertise is how can we find motivation and meaning? How can we rethink, which is what we'll talk about today? And how can we be more creative in our lives and more adaptable in, in general? So all great things that we can learn from, right? A couple other fun facts about Adam. He was a junior Olympic springboard diver. He wanted to go into the NBA, but that didn't work out for him. I would say that I think he's doing quite okay himself. Like, I think he's doing okay. He was also a magician. So this is how he paid for his time through Harvard and his PhD. He did a little magic on the side to, to make some money. Uh, but today he's known as the number one most cited, prolific, influential researcher in organizational psychology. One of the things I really enjoy about Adam's work is how he takes studies and stories and ideas and just weaves them together in such a consumable way that's really enjoyable to read. Again, it's not like reading academic stuff where you're like, oh, there's lots of big words and this is a lot. It's very easy to read and very enjoyable. He makes it very accessible, it's very real world, and his examples I really enjoy because they come from all different industries. And so his examples he uses are wonderful. And his narrative writing style is what I enjoy the most. My friends who are not academics really enjoy his writing style. They say, again, it's not academic, it's fun reading. Um, so it's very easy to, to relate to. When I was asked to do this series, I immediately first start, okay, what's a great book? Literature under, uh, undergrad. So for me, great books means the classics. But I had looked and most of those had already been taken and I said, okay, what am I gonna do? So I consulted with some friends and I thought about what, what I would choose to do. And I thought, to me, great books is something that I think everyone should read. It's something that everyone should, at some point in their life, read this book and can have an impact on them. And that's why I chose Think Again. So as mentioned, I was working on a sabbatical a couple years ago on productive disagreements and civil discourse. And as I was doing this research, a lot of people were citing Adam Grant, and I had not yet heard of him, and I said, who is this guy? Everybody's talking about him, everyone's mentioning him, and this book had just come out in February of 2021, and so I grabbed this book, started reading it, and said, oh, okay, now I can see why, right? It's very easy to read, I read it several times, and I've used it in a lot of the productive disagreement work that I've been doing. And I think that everybody could benefit from this book. In fact, I want to go gift it to lots of people and say, page 112 would be really awesome. Um, so it could be a Christmas idea. And if you get one, you know, sorry. So how many of you have read something from Adam Grant before? A couple of you, awesome communication people, of course, yes. Um, how many of you have read this book? Uh, yeah, we all, they're prepared, I'm very proud of you. So, uh, so great, well some of you are gonna be new to this, that's awesome. So he opens by talking about something we can all relate to, multiple choice tests. Some of you are already tempting, you're like, oh, it's very anxious, right? And we've all encountered that where we have extra time and we think, should I go and revise my answers? Should I have extra time, maybe I should go back. And most of us don't because we've always been told, don't do it, go with your first instinct, your first gut is right. Kaplan even warns people, they would say, exercise great caution if you decide to change an answer. Experience indicates many students who change answers change it to the wrong one. Adam Grant thought this was bogus. He was like, I don't believe this is true. So like a good researcher and psychologist, he did a review of 30 studies. And in every single study, the answer, the major majority went from wrong to right when they did revisions. This is what we know as first instinct fallacy. We think that our first instinct is the right one, but it's usually not. Grant says, we don't just hesitate to rethink our answers, we hesitate at the very idea of rethinking. So a lot of times when we change our minds, people see us as flip-floppers or wishy-washy, unreliable, unpredictable, right? 
but in reality, it signals flexibility and adaptability, which are traits that we would all like to have, right? The biggest criticism this book received was that it's nothing earth shattering or new, no new news, as they would say here in Kansas City, right? And so that's the biggest criticism. Some have also said that it's a more fluffy version of Carol Dweck's uh, fixed versus growth mindset. So many of you have probably heard of that. Where a growth mindset is intelligence, abilities, and talents are learnable and capable of improvement, whereas a fixed mindset says those things are not changeable over time. Um, and, but Carol Dweck's mindset is more focused on intelligence and abilities, whereas Adam really focuses more on rethinking and relearning, which is a different kind of strategy. So while a lot of his stuff says we should do continuous learning and we should adapt, it's, it aligns with the growth mindset, but it's definitely a more nuanced idea and is not just a simplistic version of growth versus fixed mindsets. This book goes in three sections and they kind of build off of each other. The first is opening our own minds. So he talks about strategies that we can do in order to be open to rethinking hurdles that we may not want to jump over and things like that. Then he moves to how can we encourage other people to think again? So what are the red flags? How do you notice when people are like resistant to change? And then finally, especially relevant for us, how can we create communities of lifelong learners and how can we uh, foster that in, in other people? So he starts with a quote, um, George Bernard Shaw, quote, chapter one, which is progress is impossible without change and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I'll say when I, I read the prologue, I was like, oh, this is gonna be a great book. I got to chapter one and saw this quote and said, okay, come on now, you use the most cliche quote from leadership studies. And I was very skeptical and I thought, maybe this book is not gonna be as great as I think it is. And then 10 pages later, I changed my mind when he introduced these three concepts. And so he says that we tend to fall in one of these fixed mindsets when we have conversations and debates. Um, the preacher is someone who's very steadfast in their beliefs. They're more focused on persuading others to adopt their views rather than engaging in a dialogue or a conversation. Preachers tend to have a lot of conviction too, right? We think of them as passionate and very emotional uh, persuaders, but again, not really interested in listening to others, like very focused on, on one thing. Then he talks about prosecutors. And prosecutors are really trying to win an argument, to try and find flaws in other people's arguments and try to prove that they're right and you're wrong. Um, this prior, uh, prioritizes proving a point over seeking the truth, again, not trying to understand anyone else. And then finally, we have the politician, which is concerned with trying to get approval or support from other people more than discovering what the truth is. In this case, they may adjust their views to be what they think others want to hear and not necessarily be open to what maybe the right way of doing something is. So you probably can see that you, depending on the topic maybe or where you're at, you maybe tend to fall in one of these realms. Yeah, I see some smiles and some nods that we tend to maybe gravitate towards one of them or maybe in different circumstances or topics we do. Instead, he says, these are more fixed mindsets. And instead, we should adopt a more open-minded, uh, flexible approach. And we should be a scientist. Um, the, a scientist is one who approaches conversations and beliefs with curiosity, a willingness to learn, and a readiness to adopt views based on new evidence or new perspectives. And so a scientist is more than just a person. We have lots of scientists on campus, right? But it's a mode of thinking where we try to be um, different from preaching, prosecuting, and, and politicking, where we're open and to discovery. Um, being a scientist, when in scientist mode, we're searching for the truth through experiments, right? And those hypotheses and experiments help us discover truths and, and new information. A lot of times we think experiments happen just in the lab, right? I always like putting on the lab coat and the goggles and chemicals and make things blow up and things like that. But he talks about how we should actually do that in our real lives. And adaptive leadership, which is something near and dear to my heart, uh, talks a lot about this, how we need to, if you have a hypothesis, you can go test it out, you can alter your behaviors, say, if I'm nicer to this person, are they gonna be more receptive to me in, in X situation? Go test it out, see what happens, and then come back and you have new information. And so we can do this in our daily lives, but we're hesitant because we think it's like manipulation or something, but it's a way to get new information and a way to learn new things. I love a good Venn diagram. They make me very, very happy. Um, here you can see the four types, and I like the part in the middle where it says ways you think even if they're not your job. So again, we've all go into these different realms depending on where we're at. 
Um, but there is caution because even if you're trying to be a scientist, you have the tendency to maybe move into the other realms. So you could move into preaching when you present your theories as the gospel, like this is the thing. Um, so that could move into that realm. You could veer into politician terrain when you allow your view to be swayed by popularity rather than actual uh, accuracy. And you can go into prosecutor mode when you try to debunk and discredit rather than to, to find the truth. So it is possible to kind of move, but the goal being the scientist. Grant points out that we shouldn't be open-minded in every circumstance. That's impossible and unrealistic to do so. Um, and the context calls for us to do one of these things, right? Sometimes we need to be a politician. We need to be the preacher. We need to be um, the the scientists. It depends on the situation. And I like this graph because, again, you can see the mission and the method and kind of where they fall in the quadrants um, is, is kind of a nice one to see. Has anyone heard of Mike uh, Lazaridis? Not if you've read the book. If you've read the book, you know who he is. If you haven't heard, read the book, do you know who Mike Lazaridis is? No? Okay. He's had a huge impact on your life, and your life would not be the same without him. Um, his device had a cult following. People said they could not live without it. Um, they also said it changed their lives. President Obama could, would not give up this device to the Secret Service. It is the BlackBerry wireless communication device. Yeah, students are looking at this like this is an ancient artifact, and it is. It's probably in museums now. Um, but this is the BlackBerry. In summer of 2009, it, it accounted for half of the U.S. smartphone uh, market. But by 2014, its stock and market had plummeted to less than 1%. That's a pretty quick being on high to going on low. And the downfall was the failure to adapt. So he, when he developed the BlackBerry, Mike was thinking like a scientist. Most of the current devices were too slow. The keyboards were too small. So he thought, what if I get a device you can hold in your hands, you can use your thumbs to type, and it synchronizes against all devices? and hail the BlackBerry, which was extremely popular. Other companies followed and had different versions. I was a proud owner of the Palm Pilot and had a, ah, other Palm Pilot people, yes, uh, and had that. In 2007, he was shocked when the iPhone came to the market and he said, quote, they've put a Mac into this thing, which they did, right? As the, sky phone, as the iPhone skyrocketed and became very popular, he maintained his views that the BlackBerry was the premier device and did not change. Um, in 1997, so a long time before, one of his engineers had said, hey, we should put a browser into this. And he said, absolutely not. Let's just focus on email. A decade later, he was still convinced that a browser would drain the battery and drain the bandwidth. But he never tested those hypotheses, right? That was just what he thought would happen, but he didn't test it out. He also abandoned instant messaging, which missed an opportunity that WhatsApp later seized for $19 billion. So he lost out on a lot of money. As gifted as he was in a scientist mode, he was not good at rethinking because he could not adapt to the demand in the market uh, that existed. So intelligence wasn't a cure, and Grant argues that it was a curse in this case, that sometimes our intelligence can be a curse because we're not open to, to rethinking uh, those things. This chart really stood out to me, one, because the most annoying things people say instead of rethinking. But I've, um, research shows when people are resistant to change, it reinforces that things are going to stay the same. When someone says to me, we've always done it that way, it makes my whole body twitch and my left eye just kind of goes. Um, but in the same vein, that won't work here. That's not what my experience has shown. If that's too complicated, let's not overthink it. Are all similar things people say when they don't want to rethink. So when you hear one of these things, they're like little flags that that person is not, not open to changing their viewpoints, right? They're very fixed on, this is the way we should do it. I think this is the right way. And that's a good indicator of, hey, I'm going to have to change my strategy a little bit now that I know that they are in that, that mindset. We're generally afraid to say, I don't know, right? We generally don't want to say that. My students, when they give presentations, at the end, we'll do questions, and they're terrified. They're like, what if someone asks a bogus question? I have no idea. And I always tell them, it's OK to say, I don't know, because you don't know everything. In fact, when you all ask questions at the end of this, I will probably say, I don't know, at some point, maybe, uh, to one of you. And we think when we say that, it's ignorance or insecurity. But in fact, it's what they call confident humility, which is something I think we could all have a little bit more of. 
Insecurity makes us pretend that we have the answers, right? We, I got to know everything. I'm a professor. I have a PhD. I need to know all the things, but I really don't, right? Um, confident humility is when we are secure in our abilities and knowledge, but we remain open-minded knowing that there's always more we can learn and grow and adjust from. And we can't learn if you can't admit that you have something to learn, right? In academia, the idea of imposter syndrome is everywhere. How many of you have felt imposter syndrome? Absolutely. <laughs> Most of us probably have felt imposter syndrome uh, at some point, right? I know I did when I was putting together this presentation, definitely feeling a little bit of it right now still too. It's something that, that happens. And generally when we have imposter syndrome, the advice is to say, you're fine, ignore it, you're great, you're good. Um, but Grant says actually we should embrace those fears and insecurities because they can be really good for us. So he says that there's three benefits to embracing those insecurities that come with imposter syndrome. One, it can motivate us to work harder. So if we're like, I don't know enough, it'll motivate you to work harder to make sure that you have that. Two, it can motivate us to work smarter, so we're more smarter and efficient in how we do things. And three, it can make us better learners. It can knock us off that pedestal of, I know everything, to, hmm, maybe I have a little bit to learn here, and uh, it takes us makes us a little bit more to that level. Biases, we all have them, right? Uh, we don't like to admit we have them. Sometimes we ignore them. We don't acknowledge that we have them, but we do, and we usually have a lot of them, right? There's a bunch. He talks about two in this book, confirmation bias, which is seeing what we expect to see, and desirability bias, seeing what we want to see. Um, both of these, he says, gives us reasons to, quote, preach our faith more deeply, prosecute more passionately, and ride the tide of our political party. We see this a lot in elections, right? We're gearing up for the heart of this one, and we see that no matter what the evidence is, whether somebody shows you things or tells you stories, you can't see it because you only see what you want to see if it's about your candidate, right? And so get ready. You're about to see a whole lot of it if you aren't already. Grant says his favorite bias is the I'm not biased bias. Um, how many of you have that? Yeah, yeah, some of us do, right? Where people believe they're more objective than others. And most smart people, so all of you in this room, usually fall prey to this. Um, the brighter you are, the harder it is to see your limitations. And being good at thinking, our, Grant argues, makes us really bad at rethinking. So be careful if you're, I'm not biased, biased. So, as I said, a lot, I ran across a grant when I was doing the productive disagreements. This is a picture from Buster Benson's book where the art of why are we yelling. And people don't like disagreements. They can be scary, they can be confrontational, emotions are involved, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. But Grant believes that disagreements can be productive and that generally we shouldn't avoid conflict, that we should em embrace it. He says that we should frame disagreements as debates. And that, that signals that we're receptive to dissenting opinions and changing our minds, which motivates the other person to share more information. Disagreements are personal and hostile, right? We have feelings and emotions, and, but debates tend to be about ideas, not emotions, generally. A good debate, hopefully, would be that. You, not if you've watched some of the last presidential or political debates. Um, he says that starting a disagreement by let's have a debate sends a message you want to think like a scientist, and that's a good thing. And this is where I'm going to pause and say this is the one part of the book I was like, I just don't think you're right here. Um, because as someone trained in debate, if I walk up to someone and say, hey, let's debate, one, they're not going to want to debate with me probably. But two, debate has such a negative connotation. Um, probably over the last decade, debate is seen as butting heads. It's very, in our very polarized um, society, it's not seen as the intellectual ability that we all probably think it is. And if in the real world, if you go up to someone and say, hey, let's debate about apples and oranges, they probably thought you've lost your mind and won't want to engage in that. So I don't think saying, hey, let's have a debate is probably the best thing to do. Um, instead, one of my colleagues, Chris, uses let's work the problem. He's the current debate coach. So again, he uses let's work the problem. I always say, let's talk through that. Let's talk through that together. And I think that that signals a more of a dialogue instead of a debate. Like, let's work through that indicates you want to do it together and not that you're going to butt heads and try to win. I also think that a debate is much like prosecutor mode, which is what Grant says we shouldn't do, because he says, you know, you're trying to prove that you're right and one person wins. And that's what a debate is. Usually one person wins and the other loses. So um, 
that's the one part of the book I was like, I don't think, I have an email to him. We'll see what he thinks about that email. <laughs> but he also says debate is more like a dance, which I'm like, okay, interesting. Uh, he has a quote that says, a good debate is not a war. It's not even a tug of war where you can drag your opponent to the side if you pull hard enough on the rope. It's more like a dance that hasn't been choreographed or negotiated with a partner who has a different set of steps in mind. If you try too hard to lead your partner, they will resist. If you can adapt your moves to theirs and get them to do the same, you are more likely to end up in rhythm. And so he says this dance dialogue is what a debate is. And I don't, I've never been in a debate that's really like a dance. Um, I don't know what kinds of debates he's watching, but I do think that this kind of metaphor of dance is valuable when you think about, hey, let's work through that, or let's talk through that. That kind of dialogue does allow for a dance. Like you say something and I'm like, okay, let, what about this? And so I think that approach is what I would say would be a little bit better than, hey, let's debate, um, because most people are not gonna think that's great, right? This is Daryl Davis. Does anyone know who Daryl Davis is? A couple people, awesome. He's a musician. Back in 1983, we won't talk about how old I was in that year, but in 1983, he was playing in Maryland. Um, he played the piano for country music gigs. He was used to being the only black man in most of those rooms and venues that he was playing in. After one of his shows, an older white guy in the audience came up to him and said that he was very astonished to see a black musician play like Jerry Lee Lewis. And Daryl said, well, in fact, I am friends with Jerry Lee Lewis, and Jerry Lee Lewis actually acknowledges that he was influenced by a lot of black musicians. The man was skeptical uh, and invited him to have a drink with him. After they started drinking, the man admitted that he had never had a drink with a black man before. And yeah, really, yeah, We're like, okay. Eventually he explained why, and that was because he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist hate group. Yeah, absolutely. That was my reaction when I read that as well. I think all of us, or most of us, if we sat down with someone who we know hated us or hated everyone that had the same skin color as us, we would probably say, see you later, or have some choice words or something like that. But Daryl did not respond in that manner. Um, in fact, he burst out laughing hysterically. The guy probably didn't appreciate that very much. And he pulled out his KKK membership card to prove that he wasn't joking. Um, Daryl, in that moment, again, I probably would have had some choice words to say or would have just walked out. He returned to a question that he had always had as a child, which is, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? At the end of the conversation, this guy gave Daryl his card and said, if you're ever in the area, please give me a call and I'd love to come see you at another gig. A month later, Daryl was in the area, called him up. The guy came and brought friends and, and came to the show. This friendship grew over time, and this guy ended up leaving the KKK. Uh, this then became a really big point for Daryl. Um, it wasn't long till he was sitting down with Imperial Wizards and Grand Dragons, which are the KKK's highest uh, leaders, to ask his question, how can you hate me if you don't even know me? Since then, he's convinced many white supremacists to leave the KKK and abandon their hatred. Uh, he's broke cycles that were steeped in stereotypes and prejudice just by asking that very basic question and having a conversation. Many of our beliefs are what we call cultural truisms, right? They're widely shared but rarely questioned. We don't question them. If we take a closer look, we see that they really rest on shaky foundations. Stereotypes are much like a Jenga tower and that they're missing some key supports and they're really wobbly. And really all it takes is like a little poke and the whole thing will come crashing down, right? And the hope is if you can help someone maybe knock that tower down, the next time when they rebuild it, they'll build it with better foundation and it'll be more structurally sound, right? Daryl's story shows the importance of not overlooking the power of conversation. When we choose not to engage with people because of their stereotypes or prejudice, we're giving up the opportunity to maybe open their mind. This is where I'm gonna pause and say, I think conversation in real time can do that. I don't think conversations on the internet can do that, right? If we think about uh, trying to convince a keyboard warrior or a troll online that their opinions are wrong or they need to change, that's probably not gonna happen uh, because you can't have that same kind of connection. When you have a conversation with someone, you can have nonverbals, you can have the tone, you can make connections with someone that you're just not gonna make across the screen. That's not gonna translate. So I, my little caveat, I think you can, but only in person. I don't think you're gonna win those keyboard warriors over um, so much. 
Uh, Daryl estimates that he's helped upwards of 200 people leave the KKK, uh, rethink their beliefs and uh, leave the KKK and other neo-Nazi groups. Uh, they then go on to educate their family and friends, which has this ripple effect of a larger impact, right? So he's had a huge impact on changing people's beliefs and opinions on something that's held pretty strongly and firmly, right? He says that he didn't convert anyone. All he does is ask the question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And that gets people to rethink their beliefs and opinions and realize maybe there's a different way, right? Perhaps. After getting to know Daryl, one Imperial wizard didn't stop at leaving the KKK. They, they disbanded the entire chapter. And then a few years later, he asked Daryl to be the godfather of his daughter. So when we ask questions, we open the space for rethinking. Motivational interviewing is a technique that Grant talks about in the book. The goal isn't to tell people what to do, right? Do we, we don't react well when some, I certainly don't, when someone tells me what to do, I'm like, yeah, sure, good luck with that. Um, so motivational interviewing is a way for us to ask questions to get people to think about and question their beliefs. And there's three techniques to this. The first is asking open-ended questions, right? So ask questions to get to understand. The second is reflective listening. So engaging with a person and having that reflective listening. And then the third is affirming their desire and ability to change their opinions. This is a highly successful approach to behavior change. It's used in the medical field a lot. It's also used in addiction. And it's a way to get people to change their minds when they deeply, deeply held on to um, something. The example he uses in the book is about vaccines. There's a mom who was anti-vax and she had several children and they were in an area where the measles had just outbreak. And she had a newborn baby that was in the NICU and she wanted to bring home and they were very concerned about her bringing the newborn baby to a family that was not vaccinated. After motivational interviewing, she immediately changed her mind and then got her entire family vaccinated and brought the baby home. So that is an example that he uses in the book. He also talks about lifelong learners, which I think is something we all do here every single day. We encourage our students to question themselves, to question others, and do so in respectful ways so that they can grow and learn. Um, he talks about lectures versus active learning. This is nothing news to us, right? That lectures aren't the best way of learning and that active learning and asking questions instills that lifelong uh, learning. He says, if you spend all your time being fed information and aren't given the opportunity to question it, you won't develop the tools for rethinking that you need later in life. Makes sense, right? Part of this culture of rethinking and lifelong learning is to be able to accept criticism and feedback and adapt. Challenging, right? Because sometimes people see criticism and feedback as an attack on them, when in fact it's an opportunity for growth. This is a picture that Austin, who's six years old, drew, and he was asked to draw, draw a scientifically accurate picture of a butterfly, and this is what he drew. That's probably what I drew, not as good though. Uh, but that was the first one. He then was given criticism and feedback from peers about the butterfly. They said the wings needed some work, so he adapted them. And then the wings were lopsided, so he fixed that. And then he added some patterns, and finally he colored it in. So he, a six-year-old, first grader, went from that very first one to the very last one only because he listened to others' feedback and criticism and adapted and improved his work over time to end up with the final product there. I loved this quote. This was one of my favorite quotes. Education is more than the information we accumulate in our heads. It's the habits we develop as we keep revising our drafts and the skills we build to keep learning. For me as a debater, one of the habits I have acquired over my time is to ask lots and lots of questions. My friends in the room know Terry will ask lots and lots of questions so she can understand, but also to understand the multiple angles of a position, right? So the habits that we foster um, are extremely important. Adam also talks about in organizations, a lot of his work, he works with Google, he's worked with the, um, the Gates Foundation and many other organizations to foster organizational change and cultural change. And what he says what matters the most is psychological safety. Um, it's not a matter of relaxing standards, making people feel comfortable, and being nice and agreeable all the time. That's not what psychological safety is, but it's fostering a climate of trust, respect, and openness where people can raise concerns without any kind of fear. And that's the foundation, he says, of a learning culture. So most of us who are teaching, I think, try to foster that in our classrooms and have that open, um, that psychological safety. 
Uh, in performance cultures, it's really the emphasis on results, right? So the emphasis on results means that they don't have that psychological safety that he says is so important to create a lifelong uh, learning model. Grant frequently, I follow him on Instagram. Uh, every couple days, he does a couple of stories, and I'm always sharing them. Uh, he does like little quotes like this. He'll also link them to studies and other stories and things like that. Uh, this one was very relevant. Admitting we have something to learn doesn't just show humility, it improves relationships. When we acknowledge that we don't know everything, others feel more psychologically safe and become more effective. Expressing our desire to get better can help others get better. I know this is something I do in the classroom. I'm sure many of you do as well. As one of, as adults, and when we see a little kid, we're usually, the first thing we ask them is, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? How many of you do that when you meet a little kid? You don't, okay, well that's good, you shouldn't. Uh, but my brother asked my daughter a couple years ago, she was five years old, he asked her, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And she said, you just wait and see. <laughs> I laughed hysterically because that's her spunky personality, but also I thought, well that's the best answer that a kid could ever give. Yeah, we'll just wait and see, right? She has no idea what she wants to be, she's five years old. He says that when we ask this question, it fosters tunnel vision because it then says, we're gonna focus in on this and that's what we're going to do. We have to be mindful of that. And we also can be mindful of that in our students, right? Because sometimes they think they want to do something, but maybe they need to open the tunnel a little bit larger. We have notions of what we want to do and lead, but the danger is that can give us that tunnel vision and we don't see other opportunities. A little story time about Terry. When I went to college, I went in as a music major. I could play many instruments. I was a drum major, loved music, thought that's what I was gonna do from like, the ripe age of like 13, 14 years old. Got to college, took a music theory class, three weeks in, said, oh no, mm -mm. <laughs> this is not what I want to do, right? But for so long, I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. And then I was completely, had this identity crisis of what do I do now? Because I've spent all my time doing this and now I don't know what to do. Ironically, at the time, I was in a public speaking class, terrified out of my mind because I hated public speaking with every fiber in my body. And the public speaking instructor was a debate coach at that university. And he said, Terry, you should be a debater. Come on to the debate team and it'll be great. And I said, you, I've lost all your marble. Like, no, not happening. I like shake in the insides. It's not good. It's terrifying. And he said, just come. So I went to a practice. I was like, these people are interesting. Okay, I'll give it a go. And then he's like, go to a tournament. And I said, no, absolutely not. And he's, we're going to Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I was in Houston, Texas at the time, so Wichita, Kansas seemed very exciting. I'd never been to Kansas. Now that I've lived here, I know. Uh, but I was like, sure, I'll go to Wichita, Kansas. Went to a debate tournament, won my first tournament as a novice, fell in love, changed the complete trajectory of my life, and here I am today. That wouldn't have happened if I had maintained that tunnel vision, right? And I hadn't been open to new possibilities or doing something that was way out of my comfort zone that I was like, absolutely not. Um, so as he warns us, we have to be careful not to do identity foreclosure, which is thinking we know we should be open to other possibilities that can stop us from evolving over time. We go to checkups for our doctor, hopefully once a year, right? And you get some checkups to see how things are going. Grant says that we should also do checkups on ourselves to see about our careers, our beliefs, and where we're at in life. And that can be however often, every week, every day, every month, whatever. But that allows us the time to rethink and to do so within our own confines, which is a safe space for us to do so. And I'm gonna end with my favorite quote from the book, which is, we weren't born with our opinions. Unlike our height or raw intelligence, we have full control over what we believe is true. We choose our views and we can choose to rethink them at any time we want. This should be a familiar task because we have a lifetime of evidence that we're wrong on a regular basis. So thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you, Terry. We have some time for some questions. Um, who wants to start? Okay. Well, while they're thinking, I'm going to ask you, what do teachers do in their classroom that puts people in one of those mindsets? Oh, wow. That's a really great question. I think that 
it's easy. Uh, that's kind of the default. So I think a lot of things that we do when we ask them to get up and, and speak on, I thought about persuasive speeches. I was like, oh, the persuasive speeches make them fall into one of those categories. Um, so I think that instead of doing that, we can be more open to test things out. Like I always tell my students like, hey, it's okay to be, we're gonna try it, might not work. In fact, lots of things have failed, uh, failed experiments of assignments, right? And just tell them it's okay if it doesn't work out the way you think it is, and it's okay to not, and to just foster that, having the feedback and constant improvement. So a lot of group work. So if you do group work and you do group feedback, that's a way to foster that I know everything because you get access to perspectives that you probably didn't have before. Tell us more about motivational interviewing. Tell us more about motivational oh, interviewing. Yeah, so motivational interviewing really is pretty fascinating, and I had not heard of it until I read this book. Um, I, ha I, will d I do not know a lot about it, Jeanette, so I'm going to say I don't. But basically, it's just asking questions, and when you ask questions and a series of questions, it gets someone to kind of come around full circle. So you, you start with small questions, and then you build, and you adapt based on what they're saying. And so you have a skeleton of questions that you want to ask, and then you adapt those questions based that reflective listening, what they're saying, then you adapt in the questions. But it, the goal is to get them to come around and to make a full circle. So you go in with a plan, but it might be a little bit different, but it's basically just asking questions and not giving any kind of statements. But isn't that then the person asking the question is doing either the preacher or the prosecutor? I mean, they have a goal in mind they're trying to move the person to. Right, they have a goal in mind, but they're open to the other interpretation, right? Because they're open to the other person, meaning they're listening to them and they're adapting their questions to, to that person. So they're not fixed on their standpoint. They are fixed on what their ultimate goal is but they don't maybe always achieve that. Sometimes it's unsuccessful. It is very highly successful, but sometimes it's not. But I, th I would argue that they're different because they are trying to adapt to the other person and they're asking those questions and an adaption to what that person is saying. For full disclosure. Oh, you're gonna make me do that part. Um, <clears throat> chair, is it on? Yeah. Hello? Okay. Uh, Terry and I have spent quite a bit of our career at Johnson County together, and we're the same age, and we're not going to say what that is. But do you feel, 20s, a lot of our, all of our 30s, some more of the 40s, do you feel like this book hits different, as the children would say, w through life experiences or where you are in life now versus maybe the way you were at 25? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. So I definitely think, as I read this, I thought about my teaching style, like when I first started at the age of 12, I think Maureen said I was. <laughs> um, and I, I taught a very certain way, right? Most of my students were older than me. I felt like I had to you know, dress up and be like super fancy and be very authoritarian. And whoa, have I like way changed because I've rethought a lot of that process based on my experiences of different types of students and over time. Uh, but I do think it hits different as you have more life experience. Someone who's probably younger, maybe not, it, they can still get things from it, but I think when you're older and you are looking back, you're like, whoa, there's a lot of times where I could have been a little bit more open or a little bit more uh, mindful of those things. So, yeah, I think the more life experience you have, the more examples you probably have of where you didn't do what he says you should do. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that comes with some degree of respect, whether you're a woman or a man, it's still going to come with a degree of privilege right. that you can't invent. Right. Does he account for this and how does he speak to that oh. in terms of the humility that you may be able or not, certain, yeah. depending on the circumstances? Yeah, I think he would say that that confident humility would be what, how you would acknowledge privilege, right? To acknowledge that I have privilege or I have a certain place where I can't speak to that or I have privilege which makes me in um, certain situations where I have different things, right? To acknowledge those things. So I think he, he doesn't talk about it explicitly, um, but I do think that he has in his podcast, he's talked about it a little bit, um, but I think that that confident humility would be close to that as far as acknowledging that we do have privilege and we do have different 
life experiences that make us different and that we need to be mindful of that and say it to others. That's one thing he talks about is like acknowledging that to others has a really big impact of, of changing other people's minds or getting them to rethink it. Um, can I have you, when I tell the story of I was a music major and then I changed completely, my students are like, you didn't like public speaking either? I was like, no, absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> terrified. So look what a couple decades can do to you. So, you know, there is hope. I have a question. I'm really interested in that idea of the psychological safety um, and psychological um, danger. And I'm wondering, as an, to what degree do people who are over you in your institution have the control over that? And to what degree do individuals? Um, and then maybe also, what do you do in the classroom to foster yeah. that? That's a great question. So one thing I, I didn't mention, which is that you know he talks about organizational change and culture a lot. And it's hard to change the whole institution, right? But we can start small, and we can start with your departments, your uh, teams, your classrooms, the, the things that you kind of have some control over and hope that that has a spillage effect over time. So modeling that behavior and hoping that others see it and can, but sometimes that doesn't always work, you know? Again, they need to read these books. Uh, we can make notes for them. But I think in, for this, in doing it in the classroom, Again, I always tell them, like, hey, we're going to try things out. Classroom's a laboratory. We're going to try some things. It might not work. It might be terrible, and we'll learn from it, right? And when it does and it flops, we talk about what we learned from that. And they know that I'm not perfect. I didn't create an assignment that worked the way I wanted it to. And I kind of create that and that they can model that and see it. So I think modeling behavior, but also just creating that trust and, and in the classroom is really important. Because if you don't have that trust, you're not going to get to any of the rest of the stuff. So I think the trust is the foundation of that. Does that answer all your questions? Okay. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, it really is on. Um, I'm interested in that last quote, and I'm sitting here. When I first heard it, I thought, yeah, man. And then the more I think about it, that idea that we have full control over what we believe, we have full control over our opinions, having kind of worked with child psychology, you know, people learn, people get their opinions from the people with whom they live, from the people who raise them. Right. And I'm not sure that we do then have control over our own opinions. We have to be willing right. to have control over our own opinions as we grow. Yes. So how can we convince somebody other than telling them to read the book that they need to rethink what they have always believed from birth right. has been true because that's what they've been told. Yeah, so I mean, when that's a worldwide problem. No, absolutely. <laughs> and so I teach intercultural communication. And so this is something we address all the time is that your culture shapes who you are. And then a lot of times then when you get out on your own, you, you have those experiences and you realize, oh, I mean, I did. I, I did a complete 180 of political beliefs of what I was grown into versus where I am now. But it wasn't until I went off onto my own and I had those experiences and interactions with people who asked me questions and, and made me think and change your mind. So I do, you're right. Like as you're growing up, you have those opinions because that's what you're exposed to. That's what it's instilled in you. But then I would think the challenge would be once you're out on your own and you're able to make those decisions that you expose yourself and you embrace those questions that others ask you. We have a, Not everybody can do no. that. <laughs> no, I know. We hope. Okay. We have some uh, uh, contribution uh, from Zoom. Dave Krug, Dave Krug uh, says, if anyone is interested in this topic, a book he highly recommends is Unfollowed by Megan Phelps Roper. She's the daughter of the anti-LGBT preacher Fred Phelps who, that lived in Topeka. The concepts discussed in Grant's books are exemplified by Megan's story. It is fascinating, great book uh, to listen to on Audible. As she reads it, Megan left the movement, but she talks about what helped her rethink her upbringing. So that book is Unfollowed by Megan Phelps Roper, and I'm just gonna follow that up with, do you have any other additional follow-up readings that you would recommend? Yeah, so I think any of Adam Grant's books, if you haven't read them, you should read all of them. They're all great. Um, product, like, I think all of his books are, are wonderful and, and great to make you think again, but also be creative and 
open to other possibilities. So I'm sure there's lots of books out there. I have not read that one, um, but I would say any of Adam Grant's books would be great to read. Other questions? All right. I always forget to thank people. I do, of course, want to thank Terry one more time. Thank you, Terry.